Okay, so I guess we should get started while people are still um, walking in. So welcome everybody to the um, um, tutorial on statistical um, learning theory, which is going to be led by John Shaw Taylor and um, Omar Rivas Plata. Um, I guess John Shaw Taylor doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll <laughs> quickly introduce him regardless. He's a professor and the director for the Center of Computational Statistics and Machine Learning at U University College London. Um, he has been doing research on a wide range of, to of topics, um, starting from graph theory, um, cryptography, work on neural networks, but I guess he's most um, well known for work on um, kernel methods and support vector machines. He has published over 300 research papers and two books on um, support vector machines and, and kernel methods. He's also been very influential in fostering and bringing together the research community in Europe on machine learning. He has um, founded the Pascal Network and he has also, I've been told, um, founded actually the Eurocode conference, which doesn't exist anymore, but through, ex through its success has forced the cold um, community and the cold conference to become more international and um, to move out of just being a um, purely US-based conference um, to now be a more international um, also European um, conference. Um, Omar Rivas Plata is currently um, a PhD student um, at University College London. He has already earned a degree in mathematics actually um, from the University of Alberta where he has, where he has started um, to work with um, Chavez Chavezvari, um, who he is now also currently working with at DeepMind. Um, so he, he is both um, um, in academia at, U at UCL and, and working as a researcher um, in DeepMind. Um, maybe last but not least, I've been told that um, John's father was a, <laughs> um, was a um, racing car driver and that that is very noticeable if one ever gets a ride with, um, with John. So let's see what happens if we um, hitchhike with John. Thank you very much, thank you, and uh, thank you for, for showing an interest. So, statistical learning theory, um, hitchhiker's guide. So I'm gonna start um, with a, a look at a kind of overview of why and what the aim of statistical learning theory is. Um, so, I wanna just start with a plot of two distributions. Uh, these are distributions for two different algorithms, a red algorithm and a blue algorithm. And what they plot are the generalization errors, so the test errors, um, as a, a random draw is made of different training sets. So you can imagine you've got uh, a problem you're trying to solve and you generate random training sets. You run your algorithm on the training set and you find out what test error it has, and then you do it again and again, and you create a distribution of the performance of the algorithm as you, you know, that is the random variable, and this is the distribution of that random variable over many, many draws. And I think uh, if you have a look at it, I've also plotted the, um, the mean of the two distributions. So this is the mean of the blue distribution, uh, this is the mean of the red distribution, <clears throat> these two different algorithms, uh, and they look pretty similar. Uh, but I think you can already see from the plot that actually uh, these algorithms are not so similar in terms of the potential performance that you might get when you run them on a particular training set. Remember, we only have one training set, and if we want to look at the kind of worst case or sort of, you know, tail of the performances we might expect if we were to run this algorithm on a real data set, uh, the blue algorithm comes out at a 95% confidence at that uh, test error plotted there, while the red algorithm is significantly better. Uh, so in fact, this is, uh, these two plots are made for um, a Parson window algorithm, just taking an average of the positive, average of the negative, and drawing a um, a vector between them, so it's a linear function, um, and it just is uh, very simple, and the second is a linear SVM, so they're actually learning with exactly the same set of functions. The algorithms differ only in the way they choose the function uh, 
that they, uh, that they uh, use on, from the training data. So I think uh, what I wanted to draw from this, uh, this plot is a few kind of key observations about the motivation for statistical learning theory. So what is a, a, a learning algorithm doing for a fixed algorithm, function class and sample size, the generating uh, random samples, those are the training set, uh, uh, gives this distribution of test errors. And uh, the point that comes out of that plot is if we just look at the mean of that distribution, the mean of the error distribution, um, it can be misleading. The point being, when we actually run the algorithm, we will only have one uh, training set to use. That will be the data we actually got for training that algorithm. And so the mean of that distribution may not be much use to us. What we want to know is how we perform on our training set. Um, and this is what statistical learning theory is attempting to do. It's looking at the tail of the distribution and finding bounds which hold with high probability over the random sample of uh, training data. So we want to be confident of the performance that we're going to get. Uh, in that sense, it's called worst case performance, but I think that term may be misleading and I'll, we'll come back to it in the uh, following slides. Um, so we, we're similar in sense to a statistical test. We want some sort of confidence level which will bound the chances that the conclusion we have drawn from our data uh, is not true. So the possibility of us being misled. And this has given rise to the acronym probably approximately correct, which doesn't sound very uh, confidence inspiring, but what it means by that is you have a confidence parameter and what you want to be able to bound is the probability that you uh, have large error will be less than that confidence. That confidence is that tail bound on the distribution. We want to be confident that we are not going to be having uh, worse performance than the bound is giving us, or the chances of that happening are very small. Um, and hence, we say high confidence bound, the probability of being approximately correct is high. So we're probably approximately correct. That's the, and if I show you the whole thing again, the bounds here for the, um, the Parson window, this is a quite weak performance in the probably approximately correct sense, uh, 0.3 error, whereas the bounds for the SVM in this case are around 0.22 or uh, significantly better. So that's just framing what statistical learning theory is trying to do. It's trying to give us uh, reliable estimates that we can use to uh, uh, perform uh, an understanding of algorithms and also of their performance. So I'm going to now move to an overview of what we would like to cover. Um, so we're, I'll be giving uh, some definitions and notation, risk measures and generalizations, some of the definitions that are required. I'll then be handing over to Omar to give um, uh, an introduction to what I'm, we're calling first generation statistical learning theory. Um, so it's worst case uniform bounds and the vatnik chervenenkis characterization of learnability. So this is a sort of a historical context that will then set the scene for um, the second generation statistical learning theory, which I'll, I'll be presenting, which is where we arrive at so-called hypothesis-dependent complexity um, and structural risk minimization, margin bounds, and the pack bayes framework. And then finally, uh, Omar will uh, then give uh, some ideas about next generation uh, statistical learning theory looking at stability, deep neural networks, and future directions. So that's the overview of what we plan to cover in this tutorial. Um, we'll try and leave time for questions at the end if, uh, if uh, we, we succeed. So things we will do, we'll focus on the aims, the methods, and the key ideas. Um, we'll give outlines of some proofs um, and we're aiming at what we're calling a hitchhiker's guide in the sense that we want to give you an understanding of what you can get out of statistical learning theory, how it can help you in maybe thinking about algorithms 
thinking about uh, performance and, and using the, uh, exploiting the methods that uh, statistical learning theory can provide. What we will not be doing is giving uh, detailed proofs or a full literature, and I can apologize right away to m the many, many papers we will fail to reference. I have given a, uh, we've given a short uh, sort of bibliography at the end, but it is in no even remotely attempting to be comprehensive. So please accept my apologies if your papers are not included. Um, we've tried to at least give some starting references for people to uh, link to. Um, we're certainly not going to aim at a complete history and we're focusing down onto a particular learning paradigm. We will allude to others, uh, but uh, the main focus will be this statistical learning approach. And, uh, but we're not going to give an encyclopedic coverage of statistical learning theory. So just those are the caveats. Okay, so let me get into this, uh, just introducing some of the notation. Um, <clears throat> so we're thinking of a learning algorithm as being a mapping from a training set, uh, and we're going to fix on M as being the size of the training set, and we're typically thinking of pairs, input-output pairs in the training set, uh, input and corresponding label. In some cases, there might not be a label, but we're going to leave uh, that in there anyway as a sort of standard notation. Uh, we're thinking of a hypothesis class, which is a set of predictors, for example, classifiers in the case where the labels might be binary labels. Uh, but uh, there are other possibilities, of course. Uh, we're expecting to have a training set, which is uh, uh, a set of these pairs, input-output pairs uh, of size M. Uh, so it's a finite sequence of input label examples. Uh, and the key assumptions that are made by, uh, that we're gonna use in this presentation are that the, there's a data generating distribution, uh, which we're gonna denote by P over these pairs. Um, the learner doesn't know what P is and only learns about P through seeing this uh, training data. And it gives insight into P because the training data's uh, examples are generated IID from that distribution. So that's the key link. Uh, so we're having to, uh, our test performance will be the performance under that distribution of a randomly generated example on that distribution but we as don't, the only access we have to that distribution is through those M training examples generated IID according to that distribution. Um, these assumptions can be relaxed uh, in many respects, but we won't be discussing that in this tutorial. Uh, so for example, the IID assumption can be weakened uh, and, and so on. So we, we, we're not going to address that, but just for information. Okay, so the things that we would like to uh, do with a sample is clearly learn a predictor, uh, but also we would like to certify the predictor's performance. We'd like to give some, uh, if you like, uh, certificate that will tell us the performance we can expect, as I said, with high probability, some sort of tail bound will say, okay, there's a chance we've been misled by this training set, but modular that uh, probability, we're expecting this performance. Uh, so the two uh, parts, learning a predictor, we would like to have algorithms driven by some learning principle, and they will be informed by prior knowledge that be, will be resulting in inductive bias, and we'll be trying to uh, understand the effect of that bias on the performance of the algorithm. And this will be giving us uh, the certification of performance, uh, which is really what's happening beyond the training set. So we can clearly observe what happens on the training set. Um, but what we're interested in is how we're going to perform in the wild, if you like, or beyond the training set when we actually run this algorithm on new data generated according to the same distribution. And we refer to that as generalization bounds. Uh, but actually, I think we're going to highlight, I hope, in this uh, presentation that these two things interact. A good bound will give rise to an algorithm that optimizes that bound. So it's not that we're just doing this theory for theory's sake. Potentially, 
we will translate that theoretical insight into a, an improved algorithm that will, as it were, drive, as we saw in that case of the linear SVM, an improved distribution of errors and hence an improved performance that we would hope to achieve using that algorithm on the data set that we actually get given. So these are the, uh, the uh, things we would like to achieve. Uh, the measures of performance will always be through a loss function, which is measuring the discrepancy between the prediction that we make uh, on the input with the function h and the true label y. Uh, so we have two m measures of uh, performance, the in-sample performance, which is uh, the empirical risk, which is basically the average of the uh, loss that we experience on the training data, so the M training samples, and the theoretical risk or out of sample risk, which is the generalization error, the expected performance, the expected risk that we would see from a randomly chosen test example. And just uh, as examples of the types of loss function we could consider, the zero one loss, which would be for classification would say uh, one if we make an error, zero if we don't. Uh, squared loss, appropriate for regression. Um, hinge loss, which is uh, the one that's used in an SVM, and we'll come back to that later, which is some sort of proxy for or uh, intermediate between the uh, 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 continuous loss and the zero one loss. And then, for example, we could have a log loss if we were doing density estimation where actually there isn't a label. So the label there, y, is a dummy variable in that example. So generalization, uh, if uh, H does well on the in-sample pairs, will it do well on the out-of-sample pairs? And the thing that we're looking at in terms of performance is the gap between the in-sample performance, that average on the training set, and the out-of-sample performance, the uh, performance we can expect on uh, new data. And what we would like to have are upper bounds on that, which hold with high probability. Uh, and the delta is, as I mentioned already, used to sort of quantify that probability. So delta H being less than or equal to some function epsilon of the sample size and that uh, delta uh, confidence. And uh, that would correspond to the a bound, an upper bound on the actual error rate that we would expect on test data in terms of the empirical plus this gap function epsilon. We're also interested in lower bounds, um, and this is the possibility of uh, getting an estimate of the minimum gap that we can expect. We'll come back to that again later. Uh, so flavors of these bounds, we might expect distribution free, um, distribution dependent, algorithm-free, algorithm-dependent, and clearly, you know, there will be trade-offs with the amount of generality that we're able to achieve in terms of the performance, uh, sorry, in terms of, yeah, the quality of the bounds. Again, we'll be mentioning that uh, later. Okay, so uh, having set the scene in that way, um, I'm gonna hand over now to Omar, who will take you through the first generation uh, statistical learning theory. Thank you, John. So I would like to start by presenting the easiest possible uh, setting of generalization. Uh, it might seem like a very unrealistic, but just for stars, you know, thinking from a very simple-minded point of view. Let's say that we have just one function. That's all that we have access to, one function. And then uh, we're going to use it as our building block uh, to look at the problem of generalization. So if I have one fixed non-data dependent function, a non-random function, um, and I look at the empirical risk of that function, I look at its expectation, uh, turns out to be equal to the theoretical, to the out of sample risk. So in this setting, the problem of uh, bounding the probability that the generalization gap is large 
uh, turns out to be the problem of looking at the difference between a random variable and its expectation. And that's something that in probability is called a deviation inequality. Um, furthermore, the terms in that sum defining the empirical risk are independent random variables. That's because of the IID assumption and because we are looking at one non-data dependent function only. If the function was learned from data, then correlations are introduced and then this reasoning does not work anymore. But we are looking at a non-data dependent function. Um, so if they are also bounded, if we assume that those functions are bounded, then we can use what's known as Hofden's inequality to bound the probability of having a large gap. It's exponential in the sample size and in the, and in the amount of deviation. Uh, so the usual trick, probably a lot of you are familiar with this, uh, if you make the right-hand side equal to delta, so for a given confidence parameter delta, you equate the right-hand side to delta, and then solve for epsilon, what you end up with is uh, the inequality below. So with probability, at least one minus delta, that's what we mean by with high probability, uh, we have an inequality for the true risk, the true but unknown risk, in terms of the empirical risk, which is computable from sample data, and a function that depends just on the sample size and the confidence parameter. So I would like you to, to pay attention to that frame, at, you know, to that frame part at the bottom, that's a typical picture of a generalization bound. Um, so scaling up a little bit, um, another kind of simple scenario, if you have a finite hypothesis class, a finite set of examples from which to choose from, then, uh, then your algorithm, um, let's say that we use, let's say that we look at, uh, let's say that we aim for a uniform kind of bound. If I use any function from this class, uh, how about can the generalization gap be? Um, that means bounded the probability that for all functions in the class, the generalization gap is uh, small. So the tool to use in this case, since we're dealing with a function, with a finite function class, is um, a probability tool called the union bound, also known as countable subadditivity of the probability measure. So look at the complement. The probability that there is at least one function in the class that has a large generalization gap can be bounded from above by a sum uh, in which all of the terms can be bounded. Just as in the previous slide, we bounded uh, the probability for a single function. And uh, you equate that to delta, then you end up with a generalization uh, inequality with a generalization bound that holds with high probability uniformly over the finite function class. Um, the size of the function class comes in in that inequality inside the log term. And uh, the idea is that uh, for more complicated cases, so if now you want to scale further up and you don't have a finite number of functions anymore, but maybe infinite, maybe countably infinite, possibly uncountably infinite, then uh, that number inside the log, which right now is the size, the number of elements in the function class, that has to be replaced by something different. Ideally, something that replaces the, uh, the notion of size, how big the class is. Uh, not just the cardinality, because for infinite sets, the cardinality, well, we would have a very uninformative uh, uh, bound on the right-hand side. So the next question is, what if uncountably infinite uh, function class? I'm going to go kind of uh, just describe the main, the main steps of uh, what is done in this case. One approach that's uh, used to handle this case, you use what's called the double sample trick. So you use a ghost sample, an independent copy of the sample. And uh, doing that, you kind of pass from looking at the theoretical error to looking at the empirical error on the ghost sample. Then instead of dealing with a huge space, you know, where the theoretical error lives, you're basically looking at a finite number of possible behaviors uh, determined by the second sample. 
and then with a union bound, but a clever use of a union bound where the overlaps have been handled in a smart way, then you can end up with still with a probability inequality that, that is informative. Um, a symmetrization trick comes in too, so that uh, one bounds the performance, uh, the probability of having good performance in one of the samples, but bad performance in the other samples. And uh, something called the gross function of the hypothesis class comes in. It basically tells you um, for a fixed number of examples, if I have M sample size, uh, and I'm going to use this hypothesis class, uh, how many different label, how many different label is? Remember that we're looking at the binary classification case. Uh, so how many different plus or minus one label is can I, label is can I do with this hypothesis class? And uh, um, the VC dimension is defined as the largest sample size for which you can have all possible labelings, the largest possible labelings on endpoints. So let's have a look at uh, what the upper bounds looks like. What was proved by Vapnik and Chervonenkis uh, is the inequality shown above. It's a uniform bound on the generalization gap. It's uniform over the function class. And uh, what, can, what comes up inside the log is now the gross function of the given hypothesis class, of the hypothesis class that you're dealing with. Uh, in principle, that gross function can be bounded. It's always fine. It can be bounded by, you know, two to the sample size. Um, however, if you do that, you end up with a very uninformative uh, upper bound because, you know, the log of the exponential, then the log kicks the exponential, and then you end up with a bound that basically does not depend on the sample size, kind of constant in, in sample size. Uh, things, things don't work all that nicely. But uh, fortunately, there is a tool to handle uh, the gross function that says that as long as the VC dimension of the function class is finite, then the gross function can be upper bounded by a combinatorial quantity, a sum of binomial coefficients, and that works for all sample sizes, um, which makes the gross function be a polynomial in sample size, and then you end up with a generalization bound that decreases with sample size. Turns out that uh, the VC theory kind of characterizes learnability in the probably approximately correct setting in the sense that, uh, well, first let me mention uh, the bounds that you just, the bound, the VC bound, the VC upper bound, is a uniform kind of bound, uh, but it's like in a double sense uniform kind of bound. It is uniform over the hypothesis class. It tells you that the generalization gap of all functions in the class are bounded in such and such way with high probability, but it is also uniform in the data generating distribution. Um, and we have a lower bound that tells you that, you know, there exist data generating distributions for which, uh, with high probability, uh, the difference between the risk and the smallest possible risk in the class is bounded below by a quantity of the same order as the upper bound in the sample size. So, there are good and bad things about the VC framework. Let me mention what are the limitations. Um, so the bounds are tight in the sense that we have matching upper and lower bounds, upper and lower bounds of matching order. Um, these are, this is a theory that was developed um, to analyze uh, the output of empirical risk minimizers. And uh, this is something that uh, applies to uniformly over a hypothesis space. So this is something that is not uh, tuned to a particular function. Um, however, practical algorithms usually do not search, um, or at least this is what is observed in practice, the practical algorithms usually do not search the whole hypothesis class. Um, as examples, you have 
nearest neighbors rules, support vector machines, or uh, deep neural networks. So, um, sort of like there is a mismatch between this theory and what is observed in practice. Just to give an idea, I'm going to illustrate this with a picture for FDMs, kind of following up on the pictures that uh, John showed at the beginning. So, on the same data set for which those pictures were created, uh, you still run a parsing window, that's the blue algorithm, but instead of a linear SVM, uh, use a kernel SVM with a Gaussian kernel, and uh, turns out that the performance of the kernel SVM uh, pretty much beats, I mean, even in expectation, uh, the error, the test error of SVM uh, is much, much lower. So what does this say? Uh, keep, in mind that, keep in mind that for the Gaussian kernel, the VC dimension of the space uh, is infinite. So looks like the theory is not being able to say much, or at least the VC bounds are not being able to say much as, uh, as far as the performance of kernel SVM with the Gaussian kernel. Uh, goes. So I kind of want to mention this as a, as a case study. Here is an example that has infinite VC dimension. However, the observed performance uh, is quite good. VC bounds don't seem able to explain this. Um, in fact, the VC lower bounds seem to kind of be in, in a contradiction with what comes out of this, uh, of this experiment. And the question is how to resolve this apparent contradiction. Um, so I'm not going to answer that question right away. I'm going to leave you some motivation for what's coming up uh, after the break, which is not right away. So the point is that the VC bounds are worst case kind of bounds. And uh, the example that you just saw, the graph that you just saw, may be suggesting that, you know, sometimes we may not be dealing with a worst case data generating distribution and uh, how does one then exploit uh, that? Um, well, answers will come very soon. For now, what is kind of like the Hitchhiker's Guide summary of the first part of the talk? Well, it seems that the theory uh, is quite nice, quite elegant, and uh, complete. Uh, in a way, it's right, but wrong. So it's like a nice topic of conversation, uh, but what do, how do we, you know, how does it match the practice? Uh, we don't know. So it's practical usefulness. It seems like something different has to be, uh, has to be used in order to match theory and practice. And with that, we're going to make a short break of like five minutes, that's fine? Five minutes. I've, 10 minutes, 10 minutes break. <laughs>
So uh, we're going to begin, begin the second part with uh, this um, presentation on second generation uh, statistical learning theory. Um, so what we're, just to recap, um, we looked at statistical learning bounds and the fact that they bound the tail of the distribution. That's critical in terms of understanding what they're trying to achieve. Um, and through that, they give what are called high confidence bounds on the performance on test data. <clears throat> and the VC uh, theory <clears throat> gave uniform bounds over a set of classifiers. So you basically get the same bound for each classifier in the class, um, which uh, motivates, as uh, Omar was saying, the empirical risk minimization. Clearly, then, to get the best uh, test performance, you have to minimize the error on the training. Uh, set, and then the error on the test is that training error plus the gap, which is the same for all of the functions in the class. Uh, but the point that was made uh, at the end there was that the, it's also worst case over the data generating distributions. So it holds for all data generating distributions. Uh, and this is, I think, the key weakness that uh, uh, was uh, sh being shown up by the performance of the SVM. Um, and, uh, but there seems to be a contradiction because the VC uh, theory characterizes learnability. So there seems to be kind of, we're getting good performance, but hey, you know, the performance can't be good because it's characterized. So what we're going to look at is exploiting uh, the non-worst case distributions. So this is uh, quite a subtle point that actually those lower bounds depend on particular distributions that force us to make errors. And actually, the distribution that we're facing in a real application may not actually be of that worst-case kind. In fact, it mustn't be if we're able to perform better. Um, so the bounds then become dependent on the chosen function. And that function is in some way able to uh, give evidence that the distribution is not as bad. Uh, it'll mean uh, a set of new proof techniques. Uh, so we'll try and give you a, an overview of the proof techniques that arise in order to deliver these results. Um, and then we'll finish up with the approaches to deep learning and some future directions. So that's what we're going to be looking at in this second half. Okay, so the first, uh, I'm going to start with perhaps the simplest way of making the bounds distribution dependent, or function dependent at least. Uh, and. Uh, it's the first step towards a non-uniform learnability. Uh, so the way this is set up is we take a, um, a set of functions, uh, sorry, of classes, H1 up to uh, uh, maybe an infinite, a countable infinite, countable union of uh, function classes. And perhaps they might have VC dimension uh, DK for the, the kth uh, in that sequence. And these VC dimensions are all finite. Um, and we imagine there's also a weighting scheme that uh, weights are kind of prior belief, if you like, in that class being the, uh, the class in which the function will be likely to come that we're learning. And what we would like to have is a bound that holds for, um, for each K. We're going to have the bound hold, but with the weighting uh, on the right-hand side. So the probability of being misled is now weighted according to that uh, WK associated with that class. Uh, and remember, the sum of the WKs is less than or equal to 1. So um, we can therefore apply our union bound trick again. And uh, what we have is the fact that with probability 1 minus delta then, for all of the classes and for all of the functions in each class, the gap is bounded, but the gap that we get is now class dependent. So it's uniform, the same gap for everybody in one class, but it will be uh, different for different classes. So this means that the function uh, gap will be a function of the class within which the uh, actual hypothesis that we've chosen lies. So it's a first attempt very simple attempt to introduce hypothesis dependence. Uh, and as I said, the complexity depends on the, uh, on the chosen function. Um, and it drives, as I you know, pointed out, every bound potentially drives a new algorithm. This drives an algorithm that uh, uh, returns the function 
that you see here on the right. It's the argmin over all of the functions in all of the classes, the union of the classes, uh, which minimizes the empirical error plus the gap associated with the minimum class that that function, so this k, k of h is the minimum class which that function uh, uh, is contained in. So we're actually in way regularizing according to the class index, we're regularizing the choice of function that we, so we're trying to prioritize functions with low indices but uh, trading that index against the empirical loss. So it's a kind of uh, initial form of regularization. And essentially this idea of uh, you know, measuring complexity of the function is about regularization. So this leads us to this idea of detecting benign distributions. So the structural risk minimization approach is sort of detecting the complexity of the class that is needed to solve the particular problem. So in that case, it's sort of detecting the uh, complexity of function or complexity that is required for that particular uh, problem. Uh, but the problem is that you must define the hierarchy a priori. So you, in some way, it's a little clunky in the way that you have to set this thing up. Um, and so it's not uh, effective in practice. What we would like is to have more nuanced ways to detect how benign a particular distribution is. And this is where um, the SVM comes in, which uses this margin measure, uh, which appears to de detect uh, how benign the distribution is in the sense that the data is, if you have a margin, it's sort of implying that there's some region close to the boundary where the data is less likely to actually uh, occur. And that makes it easier to separate the two classes, naturally, because there's a bit of wiggle room in the region between uh, the two classes. And you've got a little bit of flexibility, and it's easier to find that separating hyperplane in that sense. So this is the kind of intuition. Um, and it's actually been uh, formulated into a minimax asymptotic rates for a class of distributions with this uh, a, a definition of reduced margin density by o Odebert and Sibokov. So this, this idea has been characterized in that sense. Um, but while that's really kind of a very useful insight, it's making assumptions that we prefer not to make, and, and we don't know whether they are valid to make when we actually apply our algorithm to a particular training set. What we would like to be able to do is have the algorithm automatically detect that there's a benign distribution measured by a margin and exploit that to get good performance. And that's exactly what the SVM does and we'll be showing how that arises. But more generally, there are other techniques that you can, and other, if you like, benign ways of detecting a benign distribution. And uh, Mario Marchand and myself looked at how sparsity can be used as an indicator of a benign distribution. Um, so this is just to show that there are other methods, uh, other things, and it's, they are examples of what was uh, set up as the so-called luckiness framework, which is showing um, how you can detect these measures of, if you like, luckiness, benignness of the distribution, um, uh, and how they can be made, uh, data, it's essentially making <coughs> structural risk minimization data dependent, so you don't have to a priori set up this hierarchy of classes that we do with structural risk minimization, but they actually uh, arise from the observations we make during the training of our classifier. So what we're gonna do now is use the margin example as a case study. Um, <clears throat> so Maximizing the margin frequently makes it possible to obtain good generalization despite high VC dimension, as we saw the point Omar was making in that uh, plot of the, uh, you know, the generalization uh, distributions for um, the case where the Gaussian kernel was used. The Gaussian kernel has uh, infinite VC dimension, so clearly, you know, we would not expect the, uh, based on VC theory, learning to be possible. Um, 
and indeed the lower bound implies that SVMs must be taking advantage of the benign distributions since we know that in the worst case generalization will be bad. We can create distributions that would force an SVM with a Gaussian kernel to make high error. That's the consequence of that theory. The fact that that doesn't happen in practice is because the distributions we experience in the real world are actually, you might not think so, but they are actually very uh, lucky or benign in that sense. So <clears throat> we require a theory that can give bounds that are sensitive to these serendipitous distributions. And the, uh, in this case we're considering, the margin is this indicator of this uh, uh, serendipitous situation or luckiness. Um, so the first uh, intuition about how we might approach this um, is that if we use real valued function classes, uh, then the margin, in a sense, will give us some indication of the accuracy that, with which we need to uh, approximate the function uh, that we're learning. Because if there's a nice margin, then if we are finding a function that's not exactly the function, but close to it, it will have similar performance to the function. So that's the kind of intuition that motivates the first approach. Um, but uh, we're gonna actually consider three proof techniques because I think it'll be a nice illustration of the different methods that are arising in statistical learning theory. So the first will be uh, based on this approximation accuracy idea and reduces to something known as covering numbers. Um, so I'll first talk about that, but then I'll follow with um, uh, Again, using real valued functions, so a sort of similar idea, but reducing to how well the class can align with random labels. And this is known as Radomacher complexity. So I'll talk a little more in detail about that uh, and even sort of give a, a kind of sketch of the proof. Uh, and then we'll turn to looking at uh, an approach inspired by Bayesian inference. Uh, and that maintains a distribution over the function class. Um, and will give rise to what's known as the pack bayes analysis, so a combination of, sort of a Bayesian approach in that there are distributions, but uh, a pack analysis, and it's, we're giving approximately, uh, probability approximate, probably approximately correct bounds. Uh, so that's the sort of uh, the, the three approaches we're going to consider. Um, so I'll start now with uh, covering numbers. Uh, <clears throat> now, the proof here follows very much that of the VC bound that um, Omar described. We replace the test error by a proxy, which is the error we would get on a random second sample. Um, and that now gives us uh, a fixed a double sample of data. And we're only interested in the performance of functions on that double sample. And so we reduce suddenly to uh, something we can handle very carefully. Um, and we can, there are only finitely many performances that we might be able to get. Uh, or we can handle the performance that we can get. Um, and what we do here in this case, in the case of the VC, it was a finite set of performance. Here we have a, uh, actually infinite set of performances, but we think of covering the performances that we can get uh, on that set of points up to an accuracy that is given by the margin. So we've got two, two M points, the M training points and M test points, and we're gonna pick a set of functions that, if you like, characterizes the performance we can expect on that two M uh, examples up to the accuracy uh, of the samples. So given any function in the class, we can find an element in the cover that matches the performance of that function within the epsilon of the accuracy or the margin accuracy uh, that we're interested in approximating to. So that's the idea of a cover, um, that we find a set of functions that, if you like, describes the, the, the richness of performances that we can expect. Uh, we therefore can find in that cover a function that is close to the function that was output by our algorithm it's within the sort of margin accuracy of the function on all of the points. And so that function actually will have similar performance in, on the test and training, uh, sorry, the first sample and the second sample. It will have similar performance because it's uh, within the margin accuracy, it's giving the same values. So when we threshold, we'll have a, a very similar performance. And so we can apply this idea of symmetrization, which is basically saying, 
it's very unlikely you'll get poor performance on the first half and good performance on the second. The first half corresponds to the training set, so we're getting poor performance, good performance on the training set, but uh, sorry, poor performance on the training set, but but good performance on the test set. Uh, and symmetrization just says it's equally likely if you swap those perform, uh, points, and so you would then get a very unlikely if all of the errors uh, end up in one half of the uh, of the uh, of the of the pairing. Uh, and then we apply the union bound over the cover. So here we've actually uh, taken functions together that uh, are sort of close in this cover sense. Uh, and the effective complexity is the log of the covering numbers. So the critical measure you need to have here is the size of this cover. Um, and this can actually be bounded by a generalization of the VC dimension known as the fat shattering dimension. So this is the outline of this if you like, first approach to proving uh, generalization bounds for uh, large margin classifiers. Um, so I'll now move to the Radamaka complexity. Um, and that starts from considering uh, a uniform um, bound on the gap over the class. So if we think about the, uh, this is the probability, and I've put P to the M here, which means over the M sample. This is our random probability of the the, the sample, um, that the, all of the functions in the class have a gap less than or equal to epsilon is less than or equal to the probability that the worst class has, uh, the worst, sorry, function, uh, uh, the worst gap is less than or equal to epsilon. Um, trick here is to, again, use this idea of a ghost sample. So we have the original sample. The gap is the uh, test error minus the empirical in-sample error. Um, but now we use a ghost sample, and the out, uh, the out of sample error is just equal to the expected value of the performance of the ghost sample. This is the trick of replacing the uh, generalization error with the performance on a ghost sample. So now if we take the expected value of this soup, uh, remember we were looking at this soup here, take the expected value of that soup of the uh, supremum over the, uh, the gaps, it's less than or equal to, and this is really just replacing that uh, out part here with this expected value, and then moving the expected value out through the, uh, through the average, um, and that brings uh, an inequality uh, less than or equal to. So it's less than or equal to the expected value over this two sample, double sample, of the supremum of the, uh, if you like, sort of, gap between the performance on one sample and the performance on the other. So it's a very kind of intuitive uh, idea. And uh, here we again apply symmetrization, but now in this uh, formulation, this corresponds to swapping the elements. And we do that by actually adding in a variable here, sigma i, which is a plus minus one variable, which uh, if it's plus one, it leaves them in the same order. If it's minus one, it swaps them. And the because of the fact that they're drawn from the same distribution, if we swap them, there should be no change in the probability. So the expectation is identical when we introduce this uh, expectation over swapping. And these are uh, plus minus one random variables, so that is why those are known as Radamaka, Radamaka random variables, and this is why this is known as the Radamaka analysis. Um, and so now we can actually separate out these two parts, and uh, we actually can uh, take the sum, uh, you know, bound them by the sum of the two parts rather than the difference, and uh, we get twice the expectation of this, uh, this uh, estimator here, which is basically taking the supremum of the uh, function correlation that can be achieved by the function with random noise. So it's kind of a very intuitive concept here. It's sort of saying, okay, I'm, I'm looking at how well I can align my function loss with uh, random noise. And this is known as the Radamacher complexity of the class, this quantity here. Um, so I'll show that on the next slide. I'll just take this final thing here and put it onto the next slide. Um, this is the empirical Radamacher complexity is the expected value for the given training set. So this is for a particular training set. And uh, 
the Radamacher complexity is the expectation over random training sets of that quantity. Um, so what we showed on the previous slide was this bound here. The expected value of the supremum is less than twice the Radamacher complexity. Um, now, there's a couple more steps that are quite straightforward using McDiarmid's inequality. Firstly, to uh, show that the supremum of this uh, gap is bounded by its expectation, which is what we've just bounded, plus the, uh, the amount that we can change, essentially, with uh, swapping a single element. This is the sort of McDiarmid inequality uh, approach. And finally, the, also the McDiarmid inequality can be used to bound the Radamacher complexity in terms of its empirical quantity, this one that uh, depends on the particular training set rather than the expectation over training sets. So combining all of that together, we uh, arrive at the following bound, which is the uh, core Radamacher bound, which says with high probability, um, for all functions in the class, the gap is bounded by twice the empirical Radamacher complexity plus a term that is very similar to the sort of term we would get with a single function that Omar showed at the beginning. So the Radamacher com complexity is really capturing the key complexity of the function class. Um, and uh, it's this measure here of uh, our ability to correlate with random, our expected ability to correlate with random noise. So it's a key idea. Um, now, if we can apply that quite readily to um, SVMs, uh, so here it is for SVMs. Firstly, we need to measure the Radamacher complexity of the function class. And here, the, the trick is to use the uh, functions you can generate with bounded norm and uh, with a, a fixed kernel. So I'm taking kernel kappa and norm bound B, uh, then where this is the bound on the two norm of the weight vector. So this is the function class I'm interested in. and uh, the Radamacher complexity of that is bounded by the norm of the, uh, the norm bound, B, divided by M uh, times the square root of the trace of the kernel matrix. Okay, so that's, I'm not giving you a proof, but it's very straight, relatively straightforward proof to show that. Um, so this motivates controlling the uh, regularizing with the two norm while keeping the outputs at plus and minus one. Um, and this gives the SVM optimization where the hinge loss is used to take the real valued approximation that we're using to classification. And we've had to use the fact that the, if we apply a function like the hinge loss uh, to the real valued functions, then uh, the Radamacher complexity is, is only affected by the Lipschitz uh, function, uh, sorry, Lipschitz constant of the function, and in this case, the Lipschitz constant is one. So the Radamacher complexity, well, there's a factor two comes in, but it's, it's roughly the same. Uh, putting all the pieces together, uh, this gives a bound that motivates the SVM algorithm, where we use the slack variables psi i, standard notation, and the margin gamma is one over the norm uh, because we've used the uh, outputs to be plus and minus one. Uh, so this is the upper bound on the generalization error. So I've hopefully given you just an intuition about how this, there's a lot of detail I've skipped over, but hopefully it gives you an understanding. So here, the, this is the equivalent of the empirical error, the slack variable measurement. So if we were getting perfect uh, separation with a margin of gamma, this would be zero. This is the complexity term that came from the Radamacher complexity, and this is the equivalent of the term we get uh, that controls the likelihood of being misled, which was similar to the term we got with a single function. If we consider um, a Gaussian kernel, it actually simplifies down because the trace of the kernel matrix is just root m, and so we get uh, four over root m gamma. Um, so clearly you can see this is motivating the uh, minimization, uh, uh, sorry, the maximization of the margin, minimization of the slack variables, which is the, at the heart of the SVM algorithm. Uh, so this is assuring us that indeed the margin is an indicator of the benignness of the distribution and that the SVM algorithm is able to not only find a function that uh, 
is uh, performing well on the training data, but at the same time, it's detecting that the distribution is benign in the sense that there is this sort of uh, low probability uh, region close to the uh, close to the decision boundary. So in the sense of Tsibikov and uh, uh, the, the band, the, the sort of dis the thing I mentioned in terms of this uh, distribution uh, class of, this is actually a detecting that there is something of that nature going on, but it's not in any sense saying it's in those classes that were defined by Odebert and, and Tsibikov. It's not saying that. It's just saying that it's actually detecting that it's in some sense there is this low probability region that is, and it's able to detect that and find a corresponding bound. So just a few comments on the, on the Radamacher complexity approach. Um, it kind of motivates a general plug and play uh, to derive bounds based on Radamacher complexity for other kernel based um, and I mean general two-norm regularized algorithms. Um, as you can see, the Radomecker complexity was sort of characterized by this two-norm quantity. So you can sort of plug that into any algorithm, and typically, you know, kernel-based algorithms do regularize with the two-norm. So you can apply it to kernel PCA, you can apply it to kernel CCA, one class SVM, indeed multiple kernel learning, uh, regression, and so on. So there's sort of a generic thing going on here. Um, however, it's also applicable to um, one-norm regularized methods. Um, and this actually arises from a very nice property of Radomacher complexity that it's actually not changed if we take a convex hull of a set of functions. So if you think of, you know, the the functions you can generate, say, with uh, boosting, if we imagine a, a sort of one-norm regularized boosting, um, then the actual one-norm coefficients, again, we effectively have a multiplicative factor of the norm, the one-norm of that linear combination based on the Radomacher complexity of the weak learners that we're using in that boosting algorithm. So again, a very nice motivation for using that kind of approach uh, and, for example, a lasso regression would fall into that or um, different flavors of boosting, you know, linear programming boosting or one norm SVM, as it's sometimes called, would, would fall into this class of functions. So it's a very nice kind of uh, motivator for algorithms in that sense. However, the actual bounds are still in themselves not very tight. So you wouldn't actually be able to, you know, get a, a, an idea of... Uh, the real performance, real test performance. So they motivate algorithms, but I don't think we could consider them to be, you know, if you like, giving us a real insight into the actual test performance of a particular learned algorithm. So what I'm going to turn to now is the um, Pac Bayes approach. Um, and uh, this will lead to what I think are some of the tightest bounds that are available, but I think also illustrates some very nice other properties that uh, link to Bayesian learning. So I think it's an interesting study in itself. So perhaps also just to set in context, the progression is all about trying to uh, get further away from the union bound in the sense the union bound is very weak. We could make it work for finite. When we moved to infinite, we had to kind of clump functions together according to their behavior on a double sample, and we could get reasonable performance, but we're gain significantly overcounting, if you like, the contributions of different errors. And the uh, Radomacher complexity similarly overcounts the, uh, the contribution of different errors. In, in some sense, they're being counted twice. And uh, the pac braze framework is able to nuance that a little more tightly. Uh, and I think for that reason is able to get uh, better bounds. So without further ado, um, I'll, I'll now introduce the key uh, definitions for the pac bayes approach. So what one has here is a prior distribution over the functions. So you're thinking now this is a separate distribution. Remember, we've had a distribution up until now on the inputs or input-output pairs. That's our data-generating distribution. So we park that. We're going to have that. We're going to continue to have that. However, we now have another distribution, 
which is a distribution over the functions. In fact, we're going to have two distributions over the functions. There's the prior, which we're denoting here Q0, uh, which is some, uh, some uh, initial estimate of the likelihood of different functions. Think of it in terms of the prior in Bayesian learning. Uh, and then we're going to have a posterior distribution, um, which is, again, a similar function over the, uh, over the uh, sorry, distribution over the functions, uh, but now can be informed by the data. So the data can be used to, to uh, define that uh, posterior distribution, but uh, the data must not be used to define the prior. Uh, when we make predictions, we draw a function according to the uh, posterior distribution, and uh, we predict with that function. Um, so each prediction, we generate a random distribution. So it's not the Bayesian average of the posterior. It's a, uh, a random function drawn newly each time. Um, the risk measures are the, uh, generated from the risks that we've had before, which are based on an individual function. But now we average that risk over, the, uh, over this distribution Q. So here we have the in-sample risk is the average over Q of the uh, risk of the individual functions. And the out-of-sample is the similar average over Q. Again, this is all posterior distributions uh, of the out-of-sample risk. You might be wondering how we're going to handle this. Uh, but it, it works out quite nicely in the end, at least for um, the case of linear function classes such as the SVM. So here's a typical pack base bound. This is not now applied to, in any way. This is just uh, the uh, sort of vanilla bound. So if we fix Q0, so we fix our prior before we see any data, then we generate some random data um, of size, sample size m. Uh, for any delta uh, greater, uh, between 0 and 1 with high probability greater than 1 minus delta, for all posterior distributions, the KL divergence between the in-sample error. Now here, you're saying, how can we do a KL divergence? It's, think of the error as being a distribution on um, getting it right, getting it wrong. So it's a, a binomial distribution. Uh, and we're thinking of the KL divergence between the binomial distribution associated with the error rate of the in-sample error rate and the out-of-sample error rate. So this is a KL divergence between those two uh, distributions, uh, binomial distributions, is less than or equal to the KL divergence between uh, posterior and prior, plus log m plus 1 over delta divided by m. OK, so that's the form of the bound. Um, and let's now uh, think about applying it to SVMs. So we think of the weight vector output by an SVM. First, uh, normalize it, so divide by its norm uh, to make a unit vector in the same direction. We're thinking here SVMs without uh, a threshold. So think of a threshold zero uh, SVMs. Uh, then for any m uh, and any delta with high probability the KL divergence between this in-sample um, error distribution, right-wrong distribution, and out-of-sample right-wrong distribution is less than or equal to a half mu squared plus log m plus 1. Uh, sorry, what's happened? Uh, OK. Um, log m plus 1 over delta divided by m. Now, mu here, uh, I haven't shown you what it is, but what we're doing is scaling that unit vector by mu. OK, so we're scaling that up, uh, and we're allowing that uh, as a variable here for the time being. So this will hold for all mu, because we're, mu will just be choosing our posterior distribution. Um, so the, uh, the idea is that the prior here is chosen to be a, a, a Gaussian distribution at the origin with covariance equal to the identity. And the posterior is, as I said, mu times the uh, unit vector output by the algorithm, so a scaling of the weight vector, um, again with unit variance. So now the KL divergence between posterior and prior is just a half mu squared, the KL divergence between two Gaussians. Uh, and here we have actually a way of computing the 
this KL divergence between the, uh, sorry, uh, computing the uh, in-sample error, which is basically the uh, expected value of the uh, one minus the cumulative normal distribution of mu times the margin of that point. So this is the empirical average of this uh, sort of function of the margin. So it's sort of saying as the number of, uh, you know, margin errors or margin quantities goes down, we're actually going to get a very low empirical error. So it's a very close to our Xi i that we had in the, um, in the Radebacher bound, but it's a, it's a slightly more nuanced version of that. Um, so this is the, uh, the empirical error. We can measure it exactly with this particular distribution. And finally, the SVM generalization error is twice the minimum over mu of this corresponding bound on our, uh, uh, the empirical average of this Q mu. Uh, so, you know, quite a few things are happening here. Sorry if it's being a bit confusing, but what's actually uh, surprising is despite the fact that this Q mu is some sort of, you know, random classification, we're actually able to bound the, the deterministic classification. We sort of de-randomize this uh, with this factor two to the, gen the actual SVM generalization error. So it's basically quite a simple argument that uh, if this thing I it makes, uh, if the SVM is wrong, then the probability of this thing making an error is at least uh, a half. So we're actually able to, to get that kind of uh, bound. So putting this all together, what we have is effectively a bound on this, which is implied by this KL divergence. You can sort of in invert that based on the empirical error, which is computed by this e empirical average, and this quantity here, which is based on, so there's a trade-off between the scaling, which will decrease this error as we sort of scale up the margin, but increase the cost associated with this KL divergence term. And, but we can choose mu because of the fact that the, um, uh, the thing holds for all posterior distributions. Uh, we can choose mu to optimize this bound. Okay, so that's, that's the form of the bound. Um, and I just wanted to show you uh, some performances that we've uh, obtained on uh, some simple data sets, but just to give you a flavor of the quality of the bound that you can get. So um, these are the data sets. Um, and what we've applied here is two-fold cross-validation, ten-fold cross-validation. So we're also using the bound here to do model selection. So these are the, this is the pack based bound that I've just shown you. Um, and this is the uh, actual bound that you get. And this is the performance you get when you do model selection over the kernel width and the you know, C parameter, the regularization parameter, um, the performance that you get compared to the performance you would get uh, using tenfold or twofold cross-validation. So, First, I think the, you know, several things to observe. Firstly, it, the model selection is doing, uh, in many cases, as well or even better than tenfold cross-validation. Uh, so here, slightly better. Here, not insignificantly better. Uh, this case, very slightly worse. And this case, very slightly worse. But certainly very competitive across all of these data sets. Um, as I say, they're all quite small data sets. They're all, you know, standard. Uh, you know, uh, UCI data sets. Um, but the other thing to observe is actually that the bounds are surprisingly, uh, well, maybe not for you, but for me, surprisingly tight and realistic. Um, so in this case, you know, this is just a factor, less than a factor of three, two and a half, roughly. Here, uh, uh, less than two even. Here, uh, maybe uh, bigger, but, you know, a factor of 10 or so. And here, uh, as you see, uh, you know, a reasonably small factor. Um, so these are, you know, real bounds that are actually delivered by this procedure, and they're reasonably tight, and they are driving reasonably good model selection. So I think, you know, there's this idea that, I just want to sort of break this kind of uh, idea that SLT, uh, statistical learning theory, is doing worst case bounds, and they're not practical. Uh, in this case, they certainly, uh, you know, are practical and they are delivering reasonable performance. I also just want to highlight 
this is, uh, uh, I, won't, I haven't, you know, done the, uh, shown you what is involved here, but this is basically using half the training data to, to, to learn a prior and then using that uh, in terms of the uh, KL divergence. And so you can actually get tighter bounds um, and uh, in every case, you know, quite significantly tighter bounds. Um, but interestingly, the um, model selection performs less well in most cases. Uh, okay, in this case it's similar. Uh, in this case it's quite a bit worse. In this case it's uh, slightly worse. And in this case it's quite a bit worse. You can actually then turn that into an algorithm which actually optimizes this uh, bound that would be given by the sort of KL divergence between the prior now, nuanced prior uh, that you've learned from half the data. You're still using all the data for training, but you're just using the half the data for the prior, and therefore you, your bound only depends on the second half of the data, but you're still can train on all of the data. Um, and you, this is, these are two versions, but if I look at this one, look at the tightness of these bounds, 0 0.047. Um, okay, again, model selection is not performing well. In this case, it, it is, happens to be the best, but the actual bounds are really significantly tighter in many cases than, uh, say, this one. Um, so it's kind of ironic that you're getting better bounds but worse uh, model selection. Anyway, just uh, I think the main take home message I wanted to say is the bounds are surprisingly tight. They can drive model selection, but there's not always a good correlation between the tightness and the quality of the model selection. Okay, so I'm now going to move on uh, to say just a, a few points about the relationship between packed Bayes bounds and Bayesian learning which will also inform uh, some of the work that will be presented later. Um, so firstly, let's think about the prior. Um, so in pack Bayes bounds, uh, we don't, we didn't have to say anything about the prior being true or not. There wasn't any sense in which, all we had to know was that the, bound, the prior was defined before we saw the data. Uh, so the bounds still hold, even if the prior is wrong. Um, obviously, there must be some cost, and the cost will be simply in the quality of the bound that is given. If you pick a very poor prior, you may get weaker bounds as a result. Um, I contrast that with the Bayesian inference, in which there's some difficulty in that you would need to assume that the prior is correct in order to have some confidence that the inference was correct. Uh, so there's a sort of difference in quality of what's going on here uh, in relation to the prior. Um, if we look at the posterior distribution, again there's a difference. The pank bayes bounds, as I've emphasized, they hold for all posterior distributions. Um, but Bayesian inference um, would like you to, I mean, it can only really say anything about using the uh, posterior computed by Bayesian inference. Of course, there are approximations, and those are uh, nice to do and work in practice, but there isn't, there's a little bit of a mismatch between what the theory is saying you should do and what you're actually doing. But in the pack Bayes case, that's no problem. You can use whatever posterior you want. Again, it will simply affect the quality of the, uh, the bound. But what you trade here is ability to compute the bound with the quality of the bound. And finally, the data distribution. <coughs> the uh, pack Bayes bounds, um, there's a kind of twist here that's quite interesting and we'll come back to in that the, the prior can be, you, can be defined in terms of the data generating distribution provided it doesn't depend on the particular sample. Um, so, and you might say, well, wait a minute. You, if you define it in terms of the data generating distribution, you don't know what that is. So how can you, you don't even know what the prior is. But if you look at the pack Bayes bound, the prior only enters in in that KL divergence term. So what we can show is in many cases, if you can upper bound that, in other words, estimate that KL divergence from information you have about the prior and the way it's defined, the fact that you don't know the prior doesn't matter. So it's a kind of hmm, interesting, sweet trick, okay? So we'll, we'll show you some examples of that. Um, 
So in the Bayesian inference, the data distribution actually only enters through the noise model generating the output. So effectively, the input part of the distribution does not arise, which you know, can be seen as a strength in some sense. So I, I don't want to, I'm not implying any criticism there. It's just uh, you know, a difference in the way it, it, it applies. OK, so uh, I'm kind of drawing to a close of this second generation. Um, I think it leads to practical algorithms, and as I said, even practical model selection. Um, it motivates uh, and explains, I think, known heuristics, which is nice, kind of it accords with those. Um, the proof techniques uh, are refined and uh, you know, have gone through a number of iterations, let's say, uh, which I think are also interesting, uh, and have led to significantly tighter bounds. Um, so I think there's you know, quite a rounded story here. Um, but I think where you know, we are now is we're actually seeing this uh, very impressive performance from deep learning. And uh, many of these techniques are unable to provide, uh, let's say, uh, appropriate bounds explanations for, for the performance of deep learning. Uh, and for that reason, I think we may need a next generation uh, statistical learning theory at this point. So I'm going to hand over to Omar to take you to, into hyperdrive uh, on, on the Hitchhiker's Guide. Anyone heard of this thing called deep learning? Uh, so it turns out deep neural networks have faced some sort of a challenge, uh, you know, when one thinks of uh, statistical learning theory. Um, they show pretty good performance, uh, despite the fact that they deal with uh, function classes of, a, you know, very complex function classes. Um, Something that came up while John was speaking was uh, this relation, this connection between the margin and the accuracy uh, with which one has to estimate uh, the weights. So think of, uh, think of um, the output of a neural network, the weights output by a neural network. Um, if those weights somehow leave you know, in a region, uh, in a wide region, sometimes we have been called a flat wide region with good generalization, uh, then that's some property that has been connected to, um, to the ability to generalize. We would like to point out here that in the pack-based approach, once you throw in randomization, so if you do have this kind of output from your neural network, you know, weights that live in a wide region of good performance, Thrown in randomization, it seems that performance, uh, it's unlikely, it's unexpected that it will go any worse. Uh, it's quite to be expected that it will actually be, be better. I found this thing about randomness uh, fascinating. It seems that randomness has some sort of uh, uh, smoothing effect, but that's more like a personal note. Uh, um, Suigaiti and Roy have derived useful bounds uh, in this way. And there have also been suggestions that uh, stability of stochastic gradient descent uh, leads to good generalization. Uh, what we're going to do, or what I'm going to see in the next few slides, five slides left after this one, by the way, um, is uh, we're going to present an approach that combines stability with a pack-based framework that you just saw John describe and argue that this uh, make a connection with a learning principle that somehow draws from uh, information theoretic principles and uh, point out some possible directions of research. So let me first talk about stability. I like to describe it. Uh, so what's shown in the slide here is uh, capital A is my algorithm. Uh, the argument for cap capital A is a particular realization of a sample. Let's say that we're looking at a fixed sample size, M. And now I want to see if I feed different samples to my algorithm, 
How different can the outputs be? That's the basic idea of stability. Somehow measure the difference between the outputs of my algorithm when you fit it with different training samples. So in order to make this a little bit more precise, uh, and just to clarify notation two, the, argument, it's a, the arguments are n-tuples. Um, and to make this statement mathematically precise, let me say that uh, the algorithm has uniform hypothesis stability. Beta, beta is a coefficient, the factor showing in the left-hand side. Um, at a specific sample size, when that inequality is satisfied. So I would like you to think, you know, that uh, the algorithm outputs elements of a norm space. That's how it makes sense to talk about the norm difference between the outputs based from two different training sets. Uh, so these kind of models, cases where your algorithm outputs a weight vector, this applies to SVMs, more generally to RKHS, this applies also to neural networks. And uh, the property of sensitivity, uh, or the property of stability, I like to see it as uh, a property of smoothness of the output of the algorithm. In fact, it's a Lipschitz factor. Uh, if you look at the left-hand side, on the left-hand side you have the Hamming distance between the two samples. So, how different can the outputs of the algorithm be on two, uh, on two different training sets? If my algorithm has stability beta, never mind about, uh, if we know that the algorithm has stability beta, then that difference can be at most beta times the number of entries in which the two samples are different. Uh, this is not the only case in which stability has been studied. It has been studied through the lenses of a loss function. This is a little bit, uh, um, in a way, it's a, you can call it a little bit more general in that it covers cases, not only cases where the output lives in a, specially, in a space with a special structure. Um, so, the reason stability study, and I'm going to show this in the next slide, is in connection with obtaining generalization bounds, the topic of the, topic of the whole tutorial. Uh, but I want to point out that this particular notion of uniform stability, either uniform stability of the hypothesis or through the loss function, is a worst case notion of stability in the sense that uh, it is data insensitive, it is even distribution insensitive. It has nothing, its definition has nothing to do with the jet in distribution. And uh, it is kind of like an ongoing topic of research, keeping in mind a good, a good thing to look at how to bring in notions of stability uh, that capture something more about the data. So how does stability come in for generalization? I just want to show you the form of, of bounds based of stability. Uh, if you have an algorithm that somehow you have obtained an estimate of the stability coefficient for that algorithm, then you can get a generalization bound for that algorithm, more or less of this form where the true risk is bounded from above by the empirical risk plus a term that depends not just on the sample size and the confidence parameter, also on the stability factor. Uh, one thing that I want to emphasize here, why do we care about generalization bounds? Uh, so the goal should be to control, to put a leash on the true error. The goal is to have a small true error. Uh, the problem, uh, the true error is not a computable thing. Uh, we don't have access to the true error. This is something that has been, I hope this is something that has been mentioned a few times that it is, it is sinking in. So given that that is the case, it makes sense to aim for minimizing upper bounds on the true error. If we minimize upper bounds on the true error, then we're guaranteed to you know, put the true error on a short leash. Uh, so minimizing expressions of the form on the left-hand side of this, uh, of this on the right, on the right-hand side of this inequality, makes a lot of sense. Uh, minimizing just empirical risk doesn't make sense a lot, doesn't make a lot of sense to me because the empirical risk by itself uh, is not an upper bound on the true risk. Uh, minimizing some cooked up formula involving the empirical risk uh, doesn't make much sense unless there is very good indication that such a thing is an upper bound on the true risk. Uh, so this is why we care about upper bounds on the true risk. This is what we care about generalization bounds. Uh, 
Uh, by the way, the notion of stability that was just mentioned, uh, uh, it was introduced by uh, Bousquet and Alisif, and a few comments. So the idea is that uh, if individual examples do not affect too much the output of an algorithm, then uh, the output of the algorithm should be somehow concentrated. Um, this can be applied to kernel methods, uh, where the stability coefficient can be estimated and it is related, in fact, to the regularization factor, although those bounds are rather weak. And uh, a question is, if, uh, if we know that the output of an algorithm is highly concentrated, can we do better? Can we obtain better generalization bounds? Just kind of like to set the stage for the next, uh, uh, for the next slide, I'm going to mention something about Distribution-dependent priorities is an idea that was introduced by Catoni back in 07, if I'm not wrong. Um, he looked uh, Gibbs or Boltzmann kinds of distributions. Uh, so for a prior, he looked at basically the normalized exponential uh, of the true risk, and for a posterior, exponential of the empirical risk. Notice that the posterior is something computable from data. The prior does not depend on sample data, although the prior does depend on the data generating distribution. In a sense, it is non-computable because we don't know the data generating uh, distribution. But as John was pointing out, in the pack-based framework, uh, that is okay since in the end all that you care about is how far is the posterior from the prior in terms of the KL divergence. So as long as you're able to control the KL divergence of posterior to prior, then you're doing good, even if you don't know explicitly, even if you cannot calculate explicitly the prior. But, uh, so the point of this, so look at Q0, is defined in terms of the risk, is defined in terms of the data generating distribution. That's the idea that was introduced about how to bring in uh, the data generating distribution uh, to form priors for the pack-based framework. And uh, here is an example of a pack-based uh, bound on the KL divergence of uh, average empirical risk to average true risk. Of course, once you have a bound of this form, uh, you can invert it. You can invert the KL divergence to get a bound of the average true risk. Um, that's that. So I'm going to try to you know, give you a little bit of uh, an impression for what stability combined with pack-based framework can do. Um, if you have an algorithm that has uniform hypothesis stability, say somehow you know that that property is satisfied for your algorithm, um, then for a given sample size, um, you have the following bound. The KL divergence between the average empirical risk, and the true empirical risk is bounded from above by a quantity that uh, depends on the stability coefficient uh, besides sample size and confidence parameter. Uh, how this bound is obtained? Um, it was obtained using Gaussian randomization with a prior being a Gaussian center at the expected weight vector output by the algorithm and a special covariance structure. And the posterior is a Gaussian center at the actual random output of the algorithm, same covariance structure as the prior. Uh, using Gaussians then, one controls the KL divergence. I mean, the KL divergence between two Gaussian distributions is computable explicitly. And uh, this is how, in the end, uh, we care only about the norm distance between the random output and its expectation. This is how, in the end, a concentration inequality comes in. And uh, so those are the main components of, of the proof of this bound. First, um, the typical pack-based bound which says that uh, to bound the KL divergence between average risk, empirical and true, you need to bound the KL divergence between posterior and prior. And uh, we bounded that, we bounded that in view that we were using um, 
Gaussian distributions, we bounded that by using a concentration inequality for the output weight vector from its expectation. Uh, just in case that you're wondering, um, the norm being used is the RKHS norm. Last but not least, uh, there is something, some tools coming in from information theory that have been used by Achille and Sowato to somehow capture the idea of how much information about the particular training set uh, is stored in the weight vectors learned by a neural network. The idea is that uh, overfitting, that thing that we learn to kind of avoid, uh, is related to think that your weight vector stores too much information about the particular data set, then that's what we call overfitting. Ideally, your weight vector stores information about the data generating distribution itself, then that's when we have good generalization. Um, so, storing too much information in the particular learned weight vector is kind of like a way of weakening the concentration of the weight vector. And uh, the argument is that something kind of like uh, based on the information bottleneck principle that uh, Achille and Soato come up with a specific function to minimize that then if you use the bound minimizing algorithm, the output uh, is, a, is a weight vector that stores minimal information about the particular training set in a sense that they made uh, specific. This could potentially lead to tighter pack based bounds. This is something to be studied. This is something to be seen. And uh, with that, I'm closing the tutorial. So statistical learning theory, we say that it might be offering a nice hyperlift, put the thumb up, up you go, sometime soon, kind of, ish. Thank you very much. I guess we have some time. No, don't run away yet. Don't run away yet. We have some time for questions. Um, in case there are any questions from the audience, we have. Two also, minutes. Uh, John did promise. Are there any questions? <laughs> also, John did promise that we would have some references for you. These are at the back of the slides. So, if anyone wants to see them, they yeah. are available. Yeah. So anytime. I guess there are some questions from the audience. So yeah. Yeah. Do you listen to me? Yeah. Hello. I have a question with respect to the the stability plus back bias bound, I think that uh, actually doesn't converge to zero when n goes to infinity. I don't know if you can go back to the, to the slide. So it would be nice, actually, if um, you could wait five, five minutes. So we're waiting for some slide to come up. Okay, I think you can ask, yeah. So uh, please ask question, yeah. Oh, yeah, so in the slide where you have the stability plus the pack bias uh, bound, the generalization bound, uh -huh. there, is, okay. there is one term that depends linearly in n. I think it's n beta square uh, times one plus log over one delta square. But you if you divide that by n, that means that the, the bound doesn't go to zero as n goes to infinity, right? That's how, that, what's the meaning of that? It has to do something with the prior and the function space, on the hypothesis space? 
so I, as I understood, maybe I, I can repeat back what you were saying. The beta would be independent, would be dependent on n or, or the yeah. sample ah. size potentially. Right? I see. Um, so in practice, it is, but not as strongly as that. I mean, in our experience of applying this pattern, we have actually, you know, generated these. The actual uh, rate of increase of beta is 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 less uh, sharp, and you actually do generate. What what we are not so happy about is the fact that as you raise the uh, generally the uh, regularization, this does become weak. And we believe that is as a result of too much, you know, there's sort of a, if you like, a, a uniform um, bound on the um, uh, stability, which doesn't take into account the specifics. So it's a bit like, you know, our VC thing. This is like VC for stability. We need to have a more nuanced understanding of how stability actually operates in a particular case. I see. Uh, so that's, yeah. I think, uh, I see, I see. Okay, thanks. key question. So there's one more question. It would be really nice if everybody else could try to be quiet, um, just for the time that the question is asked. Yeah, hi. So thanks for the great talk. Uh, so in the beginning of the talk, I think the first generation, right, there was some criticisms that the bounds were um, not realistic for real data that you see in, in real world settings, right? And so you've worked you know, to make them more tight. Um, but then now that we have this, um, all these adversarial examples popping up, uh, potentially maybe those original bounds are actually, you know, they, they are doing what you would expect to see if you consider adversarial distributions, which according to this morning's tutorial are abundant and they're all over the place. So I um, just wanted to hear what your thoughts are on kind of these other adversarial distributions that, are, that supposedly are realistic in the real world. So uh, just to repeat what I think you're asking, I mean, were you asking about the problem with, let's say, adversarial inputs into a deep network and the fact that they can be used to uh, actually cause the uh, network to make an error? Or are you just thinking generally adversarial situations where you don't have IID data, but you're having bounds that uh, are somehow worst more, case more, over more, all possible inputs. More of the former, where... The former. Yeah, yeah. so, so former. The, the data, the inputs have been manipulated to uh, misclass, you know, to uh, increase the error. Yeah. Right? And so, uh, and some, some of the bounds that were shown were quite large, if you consider adversarial examples, which I think reflects those early uh, yeah. bounds. So, yeah, I mean, the, these bounds based on IID data the chances of you hitting those adversarial inputs are so low that the fact that they make an error will not appear in, you know, will not affect these bounds. I think we would need to have a much more, I think the, the key there will be learning properties of the distribution. So in, a, in some sense, the manifold, which is, I think, the key to, uh, if you like, the difference between those errors that are made, you know, through sort of pointing very slightly differences as opposed to perhaps understanding some structure in the data, which would, you know, for, so for example, in an animal, you would identify eyes, you would identify the type of fur, you would identify a number of factors, and you'd have to cause errors in all of these factors in order to make an error in the classification, rather than just, you know, somehow some gestalt of the image that is used in the deep network case to, to do the classification. So I think it's more about, the, the way to approach that problem is to try and pose the problem as a learning problem about structure in data rather than just as a classification problem per se. Uh, but I think you know, that doesn't mean SLT wouldn't have a role to play in doing that, but I think it would be a, a more structured role in learning different sort of elements, if you like, of the, of the structure of the input. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Are there any more questions for the speakers? Yeah. So regarding your last slide, could you elaborate a bit more on um, this information and how it, um, information complexity um, and how it can be used to optimize the bound on the so the um, the argument made this isn't you know uh, uh, obviously our work uh, Kili and Suato have looked at this idea of measuring the amount of information in the weights. So the, you, you, obviously the information in the weights has two sources. One is the underlying distribution, but then there's also the question of whether, given the underlying distribution, is there more specific information about the actual training data that was used? 
And the point they're making is if there's too much information about the training data as opposed to the underlying distribution, that implies some sort of overfitting. They make the argument that uh, actually stochastic gradient descent, and particularly the information bottleneck, does in some way control that, but not in such a specific way that, uh, you know, that it might, that there could be criteria you could use that would actually help you to control this more tightly than perhaps, you know, it's sort of almost a byproduct of uh, the sort of information bottleneck training that is frequently used in st with stochastic gradient descent. I think there's also this possibility there's a relationship with um, you know, differential privacy and the fact that you introduce randomness and so you know, the specific information about elements of the training set are get lost and are not encoded in that. So there's a connection there potentially as well. So I think these are all ideas that we believe could be used to in some way improve the bounds on concentration that you get, which will then improve the bounds on the generalization because these depend on the concentration, if you like, of the actual weight vectors you observe relative to the expected value of what you would observe over a, a set of random uh, training sets. So that's the idea, but as I say, it's, it's quite vague at this stage, but it's, uh, I think, a, an intriguing approach, and I kind of was feeling this is actually potentially a, a new way of thinking about generalization, which is different from the margin or the sort of you know, region of weight space. I think margin and region of weight space are very similar. You know, in some sense, there's room in the say, in around the solution to do similar stuff. And you kind of, if that's a lot of room, then you kind of almost divide the total complexity by the complexity of that space. And that gives you some sort of quotient, which would be the complexity of your algorithm. Which I think, it, but I think this is different in some sense. So that's, that's the, I think, intriguing direction. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? If not, let's thank the speakers again. Okay, thank you.